Okay, we're all here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So welcome to The Juice. Um, we haven't had a program in a while, so I'm excited to be um, to be back on board. I'm also very excited to be at the Start Garden space using my Start Garden mug. So, um, <laughs> that's kind of a first for The Juice because I we started the program um, from home. So slowly transitioning back into the Start Garden space. So that's um, exciting for me. Um, and so this morning we're actually gonna um, it's, it's a little bit different of a juice panel in that I have Jorge Gonzalez, um, one of my co-directors at Start Garden, who is going to um, host with me. And we've got a panel that Jorge is going to introduce. And we're actually recreating um, or, or kind of redoing a panel that Jorge had on his show. I'm going to I stumble every time. Emprendendor X. Very good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I have to say it in chunks in order to say it right. But in any event, um, a really interesting topic. Um, and I know that um, when it was done uh, in Spanish, it, w it had, you know, it, it really resonated. And I think it's a conversation that um, we need to have broadly. So um, we're going to be, you know, talking this morning. And uh, so Murphy is here from Star Garden. Uh, our technical guru. So I'm just going to jump in and let Jorge kind of introduce the topic and introduce our guests and we'll be ready to go. And as, as is typical um, with the juice and, and all of our programming, if those of you are watching have questions or comments, um, let us know and Murphy will um, kind of break in and let us know if we can address some things for people. So take it away, Jorge. Well, I'm not taking it away. I'm just going to you know, introduce uh, the, the panel, but it's still your show. So I'm also here at Star Garden. So um, I, once again, it feels good to use these cups as we were using the uh, um, temporary cups for, for a while. Um, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Murphy. My name is Jorge Gonzalez. I'm also one of the directors here at Star Garden. And just like Lori, um, we have been doing a, a show similar to the Jews, which we call Emprendedor X, uh, but geared toward the Spanish speaking community. Uh, and we talk about uh, entrepreneurship issues, you know, hardships during COVID, uh, pivoting, uh, everything that, um, that has been discussed here at the Jews, we have been discussing uh, at our show in Spanish. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was a little bit interesting because we were talking about assimilation and acculturation uh, between ethnicities and you know we thought about the food industry and how you know what's authentic and what's not authentic when it comes to ethnicities um, and I'm like you know what let me talk to my experts out there and let's talk about these issues as to you know when does it become acceptable that you know someone that is non-Dominican uh, is going to serve Dominican food or when does it become acceptable for a non-Mexican to say they sell authentic Mexican food and what's the definition of all, all of those. So um, thank you to my guest, uh, my three friends that uh, they had actually done this with me a couple of weeks ago you know, at 5 p.m. And now I took them away from their jobs to do this at 10 a.m. So uh, thank you for your time. Um, and I know, uh, especially in short notice, I just asked you, you know, last weekend. Um, so. I'll first start with uh, Paula Mendeville. She's a catering manager for El Granjero, authentic Mexican food um, over on Bridge Street. And um, so welcome, Paula. And I'll have you guys do a little bit of uh, introduction from yourselves as far as how your restaurant started and how you know long you've been in the industry and so forth. So uh, welcome, Gilma de la Cruz, uh, also um, Part of the Star Garden team, where she was part of the Star Garden 100, started with a uh, El Caribe food truck, and now over the past year, year and a half, uh, actually has a brick and mortar here in downtown, uh, El, El Caribbean Art and Fusion Cuisine. I think I hopefully said it right. If not, she'll correct me. Um, and lastly, but not least, uh, our good friend, uh, Chef Oscar Moreno. Uh, also very um, intentional in having pre-Hispanic authentic Mexican food 
Um, and I'll let him introduce himself, but I forgot to say that also Hilma, a uh, very authentic Dominican food uh, here in downtown GR. With that, uh, Paula, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Jorge, for having us again. It was fun last time and controversial, so I'm sure it's going to happen again. And yes, <laughs> El Granjero Mexican Grill, we have been in business since 2007, so it's going to be 14 years this fall. We're really excited, especially after the pandemic. We survived. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, my mom and I are from Mexico City. So uh, when we came and that restaurant was Tacos El Ganadero, they used to serve more food from the region of Durango, where the owner was, was from before. And we kept some of those recipes and dishes. But my mother, her the first thing she wanted to do is bring nopales, cactus, to the menu. So we added lacoyos, we added uh, different dishes with cactus, and, and that's what she's more, most proud of. And um, I think that when you open a restaurant and you have a concept, you tend to go with the cuisine that you are most comfortable with. But now through the years, we've seen that the owners don't have to be from that ethnicity. Perhaps their cooks, ha cooks or chefs have more of a broadened international even um, experience and background. And that's okay, that's wonderful because I, I feel that all the time we tend to do this emphasis of how West Michigan is vibrant and friendly and inclusive and uh, diverse. But we need to focus on two areas to really truly have people feel that way. And that will be one language and then two food for sure. Gracias, Paula. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into it. Um, Hilma, let's talk about you and um, how your restaurant started. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the invitation again, Start Garden. I always love to be part of your, um, your show here. Um, so we started uh, with El Caribe food truck um, for almost four years ago, and it started to go very well. We saw the need of having a brick and porter and sharing our culture and our authenticity uh, food in um, Grand Rapids. And that's why we decided to open our Caribbean fusion cuisine um, in downtown. It has not been a year. We opened during the pandemic. Um, so it's going to be one year in July, July 10th. It's our uh, one year anniversary for Art Caribbean Fusion Cuisine. And um, we're still trying to survive this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we focus, like I said before, it's um, sharing culture, sharing our food, um, sharing the art uh, from our country with the community and um, creating that diversity in downtown with our clients and that we make that impact and make people happy with food. Thank you, Hilma. Uh, Chef Oscar. You're, you're on mute. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Chef Oscar from Meso, and uh, we are going into our third year of business uh, here in downtown, uh, 118 East Fulton. Our Mexo is uh, focused in, in the history of Mexico through the food. And um, the reason I created the concept is to uh, show people the evolution of the Mexican cuisine um, from the pre-Hispanic times to after uh, we were conquered by the Spaniards. And just to show you like the healthy part of the pre-Hispanic diet. Um, and also like, you know, um, after we adapt uh, ingredients from uh, the Europeans and techniques, and then what's Mexican cuisine and this time. So the focus is on more in history, more than regions, uh, uh, basic on, on food. Great, thank you. Laurie, do you have any questions or? Well, I think, um, you know, if we, I, I'd like to just get kind of started talking about um, how important it is to distinguish between, you know, authentic, uh, you know, in, in each one of your cases, authentic food versus food that, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say mimics, but um, is, you know, a representation, but not an authentic representation of, for instance, Dominican food or Mexican food. I mean, we see that everywhere you know you can go into applebee's and find mexican food on the menu but it's not authentic and so right. 
Um, why is, uh, you know, I, why is that important that we understand the difference and people understand the difference? Any, anyone? Okay, I'll start. Um, to begin with, I don't like to use the, the word authentic because okay. authentic is very complicated work. Um, anybody from this region can say this is authentic to my region or to my town or to, you know, but I like to go more traditional, what is traditional from the culture and more uh, truly close to the history and, you know, history doesn't lie. So as soon as you get closer to the what happened, you know, in the history, then, you know, you can be truly more of what your concept should be. Okay. All right. That makes sense. And, and I just learned something because um, uh, you're right, Chef Oscar. Um, and we're going to talk about this uh, between assimilation and acculturation and the definition of both. Um, but even myself, growing up here in the U.S., when I see authentic, I think of like real Mexican food. I never thought of the way you were saying about authentic to a rigid um, versus a word traditional. So even I even learned something today. Yeah. Go ahead, Hima. Um, I actually, what um, Chef Oscar just said, I was reading about that earlier today because um, I was getting some information about some ingredients from the Dominican Republic. And I found that um, a lot of the dishes from the Dominican Republic come not not originally from the Dominican Republic. They're coming from Africa, from Spain. Um, some of our dishes, um, if you've eaten before mangu, which in Cuba is also called as fufu, uh, mangu actually came by because um, an American person came to the Dominican Republic and was served uh, mangu, which uh, back then it was called um, puree de platano, platin puree. And when the American person had it, he said, man, good. So the Dominican person, what he understood was mangu. And it has stated like that for years and years. It was a language um, translation that did not go the correct way. But for years and years, for us Dominicans, we have thought that that's the originality of the word mangu. And, you know, so a lot of our things we we believe that it's oh, it's really authentic to us. It's really authentic to our country, but we we lack sometimes on going beyond and, and learning about what what came to that dish, what brought that dish to our country, and how can as chef we tend to give our special um, touches to our dishes as well. So um, sometimes we, like Chef Oscar said the authenticity can be a little tricky because we lose the authenticity because we want to give our special touches. We want to get, make it special as and make it our own. So we might take a dish and make it different, but it does, trying to translate to the originality of the dish. Mm -hmm. I agree, Chef Gilma. I mean, I think all dishes and all cultures go through a, an evolution of their tastes and their, you know, even the, the ingredients that they're available for them. Um, I remember my mom, when we moved here to Grand Rapids in 2005, she was craving this dish. It's called, what is it called? <laughs> uh, it's with it's kind of fish. I, I can't remember right now, but she was like looking at all the restaurants and they didn't serve it. And usually people will recommend it at big cities like, oh yeah, I had it in Chicago. I had it like in New York, you can get it. And she's like, what about here? And, and, and I feel that that's kind of like the struggle that restaurants owners go through when we talk about authenticity, when we talk about originality, when we talk about what is common and what is traditional, like Chef Oscar said. And, and one of the things that I feel El Granjero has been su successful is because we do comfort food things that bring you back to memories when you try probably this kind of food at your home or growing up in, in different parts of Mexico. Um, yeah, with, with comments like, this is what my mom used to make, or this is how my grandmother used to make mole or gorditas, things like that. And that's what makes us proud that we do take them back to those times of precious memories. At the same time, they create a memories at the restaurant because they bring their family so the kids get to experience. There's nothing more rewarding to see children get, you know, their little taquitos or a um, 
a different dish like a tamal or tata, instead of like the usual, give me a quesadilla with fries or give me a wet burrito. No, they are going for like my children. They love enfrijoladas. They could eat that every day, which are like enchiladas, but with the um, homemade bean sauce, the black bean sauce. So things like that, it's what makes us proud of the food we serve. But we understand there's always been an evolution and evolution will come to it as well. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, this year has been very popular, the quesabirrias. Who has tried quesabirrias? I think most restaurants serve them now. And, and, and honestly, before it, it used to be just the soup, the actual broth the meat and you make your own tacos out of it or you'll just have tortilla. But now the creative way, okay, make like make a quesadilla out of it. And and um, now there's a restaurant, our friends at Caldos El Giro, Jorge, uh, Maria Elena started now a trend of making birria but with ramen soup, like a combination of it. And I don't know, I haven't tried it, but you know, just being creative and being innovative uh, because there's a competition now for the quesadillas, not only on the Hispanic owned restaurants, but like you mentioned, other maybe even chains that starting to like pick on that trend and that they want to serve it. So I think it's really interesting, Chef Oscar. I, I love the fact that you, you kind of positioned traditional versus authentic because Correct. Uh, you know, like even Jorge said, he learned something, and I clearly did. Um, okay. But Paolo is just saying, you know, um, the food industry is just, you know, chefs are creative people. So, you know, there are there are traditions, and yet I, I think chefs are always trying to evolve um, and throw their own spin onto things. And as as things become trends in the food industry. Um, you know, everybody maybe tries to, to go with the trend, but give it their own their own flair, and and maybe it's bringing in some more of the tradition of the ethnicity of of the food. So, uh, you know, it is it is kind of interesting because you can have your menu evolve. Um, right. Yeah. So one of the things you know is I discovered through uh, pre Hispanic food. And a lot of people don't know this. When um, in Mesoamerica, that's part of the name of the restaurant, the ME for Mesoamerica, uh, before the Spanish arrived in Mexico, and the XO is for after we got uh, gained our independence from the Spaniards. So the Mesoamerica, we didn't have cows. So we have no dairy products at all in our food. So all our food, and it was gluten free and dairy free. So we didn't have that ingredient that it will, you know, it will cover the real flavors of the Mexican cuisine. Uh, it was a lot of clean flavors uh, with herbs, you know, like fruits and mm -hmm. insects and proteins that, you know, they're still available, like, you know, like pheasants and, you know, um, boar, um, you know, rabbits and stuff like that. And the majority of the Mesoamerica people, they, ate a lot of herbs, you know, insects and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously corn and beans and, you know, amaranths. Uh, um, when the, you know, um, milpa, which a lot of people, like even from Mexico, don't know what milpa is, uh, means. And now what means, you know, the trinity of the plants. So the plants, um, they used to plant corn and then beans or zucchini, squash, and um, chiles, you know, like different kind of peppers. So they uh, discover, you know, like the beans and the squash, they will like uh, hold the humidity for the uh, corn to grow and the corn will help, you know, like the beans and the squash to grow and the chilies will be like a natural pesticide. And then uh, that was part of our diet uh, back then. So, you know, like focusing those things and techniques that they used to use, that's how I base, you know, like recipes for the restaurant. Even my moles are completely gluten free. Uh, vegetable base, like I don't add gluten or tree nuts in our moles. So it's like even somebody that's vegan can, you know, like enjoy our moles. So I just, you know, like if it's going to be pre-Hispanic, then we read and resource a lot about pre-Hispanic food. And yeah, you know, the evolution of the cuisine, yeah, where after we, you know, like adapt all the ingredients, then, you know, we start adding to like the modern Mexican cuisine and, you know, um, it's, it's a great combination too, but you know, knowing where it came from and then where we ended, um, I think it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, Jorge, why don't you talk a little bit about the, um, the difference between acculturation and assimilation? Yeah, for sure. And I think as I'm listening to uh, our three guests, um, um, I'm liking the idea of the terminology of evolution. Um, <clears throat> because when people migrate, uh, historically, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, aside from the Native Americans, uh, all of us come from other parts of the world. And we bring our cultures, we bring our traditions, we bring our foods, we bring our, our typical dress. Um, and we come here, we become Americans, and but we keep our traditions. So that's acculturation. Acculturation means that um, I can, and I used this example earlier with Lori, I can, at Thanksgiving, my family can have the turkey and the traditional, what's the traditional Thanksgiving, but we also have tamales, we also have uh, flan, we have, you know, all, all the other traditional of my culture type of food. I'm sure Hima will have something different because it's Dominican Republic. Um, so that's acculturation. What I was telling you, Lori, that assimilation is um, when a minority group gets fully emerged into the majority group. So the day that my future generations have a Thanksgiving dinner and they don't have the tamales or flan or the typical things that I, I was acculturating them with, they have assimilated. So now it's a simulation. They are part of the bigger group. Um, does that make sense, Lori? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, um, I guess, you, you know, neither neither is, is right or wrong, but it, it seems like we would want to celebrate um, all of our cultures, you know? And so um, I think it's important to to distinguish and, and to be able to celebrate um, and not feel like you're losing your heritage um, and losing, you know, your traditional cuisine. Um, so, yeah, I, what, do you, what do you guys think about that, panelists, you know? I think it's it's really important to to transfer that to to your clients that um, even though we have adjusted in our case we have adjusted the menu so that our community understands it and that they feel um, some type of connection. Um, last time we had with Jorge, I said I, I had to cook something because I was by myself at the restaurant and I had to make a what we call our art burger, uh, but our art burger originated from a Dominican sandwich called chimi sandwich. Um, and a lot of times when we refer to the word chimi, we either think about the chimi, chimi the chimichurri sauce from Argentina. Uh, but this is it. There are chimi sandwiches, the national sandwich in the Dominican Republic, which consists of grilled meat, cabbage, red onions, uh, mayo, mayo ketchup, and, um, and it has tom green tomatoes. Uh, for us, we so what I did is I recreated my version of it, and I I made it with sweet plantains, which is a Dominican um, very common item on our on our table. Um, I added fried cheese, queso frito, which we use with mango. Um, we added um, and then all the rest of the ingredients that we use for the chimi. But it's a burger for. For most people, it's considered a burger, but we I added those touches of the Dominican field so that we have that impact on that on that menu item. Um, for me, it's very important when our clients come to the restaurant that not only they feel the culture in the food, but also in the ambience, the music, you know, the the salsa, the bachata, um, the artwork that it's placed on in the in the restaurant throughout the restaurant. Um, We've talked, I always talk about this, about how we can make that also teach our kids to learn about our culture, to learn about our food. Um, even if they don't like the food, we have to show them like, for us, rice and bean and meat, it's our, it's our flag. Mi bandera, it's what Dominicans always call in the Dominican Republic during lunchtime, we eat our mi bandera, which it consists of white rice, beans, and meat. Um, and in my menu, we have a menu item, a menu um, section that's called like that, Mi Bandera, where our clients get to choose what rice do you want, what meat do you want, what beans do you want, so that they create their own plate with, plate with what we give them. But that's representing my flag, my bandera. Um, so all those little items that we 
try to teach our clients as well. It's just that I'm not just going to go eat at a restaurant, but I'm going to have a whole experience. Yeah. So that's very important for us. Oh my gosh. Is it lunch time yet? Because I'm hungry right now. I, what I know. time do you open? I'm thinking about all this wonderful food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's important, that's why I mentioned at the beginning, that if West Michigan really is the community, the diverse and inclusive community that we say we are, we need to include more of that language and perspective, uh, definitely food in, in that concept, not only how, the, how people look in the different spaces and communities and workplaces. It's all about in, uh, inclusiveness. And that's why I love so much the festivals. I have a great time at all the kinds of festivals that we have and we keep adding, which is great. And most of the time, like, I don't think I, I never met, except obviously last year, like the Hispanic festival or Mexican festival. We always go and that's what I want my children to see because that brings memories from when I was growing up in Mexico. They're not there, they're here, but they can still experience some of it. I always tell my, my kids, you're a Mexican. And they wear their flag proud and they speak the language and obviously they, they do like the food. Of course, they're growing up here too and you know, my three-year-old can recognize a McDonald's logo from like a mile away. He's like, McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. And it's how it is. He will have a happy meal if he wants every day. And 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 so it's just that finding that balance. So I'm okay with him growing up to those kind of like um, uh, customs too. But I want him to make sure he understands where he comes from and what my so one of the uh, festivities that I love is Dia de los Muertos. I think it's very important, that holiday. And I remember going to a cemetery with my family and honor the dead and, and having our altars and our um, a home. So when the public library included that in their programming, it was amazing. And he, it has grown so much in the past five years from having a couple hundred visitors in the altars to thousands. And we get serve them food and they listen to stories it's just like it really wraps them up into what we know that day to be and and the other celebration that been trendy for for the most part here in the u.s that i'm not too convinced <laughs> and we always like sound like the grinch of the cinco de mayo and chef oscar can bat me up here but we're never like it's no it's not about sombrero and margaritas it's not um i have a i had an experience uh in one of the local one of the local restaurants here in east town they started to do a cinco de mayo celebration and i think i went because they had live music they had cabildo play and you know, it was a great time with friends. So for the couple of years it was small, but then one time it was like a street party. They closed the street, they have old people everywhere. And I think a food truck and again, live music and all that. The day, the year I stopped going to those parties is when they start giving sombreros and sarapres to everyone. And here you have a bunch of white people wearing sombreros and saying, hey, this is a fiesta, amigo. And that's when for me just is just too much. That's one. It, instead of a corporation, it's just a mocking and making fun of it. And and then we have to be accountable for the times we've done it. Because when I first moved to Grand Rapids a few years later, because I was underage, but one, once I could go to bars, we went to a, a green, what's it called? San Paris Day. Oh, yeah. And I did the same. You know, you dress in green, you will do all those things. And, and so back then I didn't even think about it. But when it's done to your culture, you're like, wait a minute, stop. So I don't know if you, you have similar experiences with that. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, it's, it's hard to understand and to know where to draw the line um, between trying to celebrate something and have fun, like a cultural holiday. Um, and when it crosses the line into being sort of insulting, you know, I think people naturally, people want an excuse to go out and drink and eat and have fun. And so, you know, these holidays and these, these celebrations, um, you know, they start out with, with some, uh, some sort of meaning, but then it, it does kind of explode into, um, you know, it's an excuse to have a party. And I think, um, you know, 
for me, it's it's really it's interesting to hear, you know, you say that at one point it just it went over the top. It was it was okay up until the sombreros. And and yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I don't you know, I don't know if people uh, realize when they've crossed the line. You know, and just to add real quick, and uh, I know that we, we realized that um, Hilma, Paula, and Chef Oscar, we talked about this at the Spanish one, that, yeah, this can be a controversial issue, but we're, we're being respectful. And um, just to add to Paula's comment, uh, the ownership of that particular restaurant that we're talking about is not even Latino. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was more of a slap in the face when yeah. you got a non-Latino, uh, celebrating uh, a festival that we don't celebrate in Mexico, uh, but yet here it's a big reason to drink uh, Corona and wear sombreros and uh, all of that that is condescending to us. Right. Uh, but like I said, once again, we're being respectful, but we're just saying, where do people cross the line? Uh, just as we are guilty when we go to the, you know, St. Patrick's uh, Irish festival or, you know, any other ethnic uh, festival. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally, I totally understand that. I mean, you know, people are business owners, and right? So they're looking for a reason to have customers come into their restaurant. So, oh, you know, it's Cinco de Mayo. Let's do a Cinco de Mayo thing. But it is, it is without, in a lot of cases, it is without the thoughtfulness behind that. And um, so it does, it does cross the line. But um yeah, let me, let me ask you a question uh, to to our three um, restaurant owners here, um, Lori. You and I kind of talked about this right before the show because I'm, you know, you made me think. It's like you know, everyone that has migrated here has brought their foods, traditions, all of that. So it made me think. Like, what is what is American food? Can you name me what's American food? Is it hamburgers? Is it hot dogs? Is it pizza? Because pizza came from Italy. Um, I understand hamburgers came from Germany. Um, I'm, I, can you guys, and maybe Chef Oscar probably knows more about this, but uh, can you guys answer what, what's American food to you? Is it burritos? To, to me? <laughs> to me, American food right now is everything. It's the old, you know, like the conjunction of all the cuisines, but obviously like every country has, you know, the history where things came from. And I focus in the history of Mexico, and that's what I brought here. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that you guys were talking about, like Cinco de Mayo and all those things, I think as a restaurant owner, if you're going to do a concept party or whatever it is, a celebration for another culture, you have to educate yourself about what it means to that country, what it is respectful to that country. You just don't uh, go with the, uh, you know, like marketing, you know, of the, you know, beer uh, brands that they just want to throw you know, more dollars in your lap, you know, it just, I think is you have to educate yourself about uh, the culture that you are gonna, you know, talk about or show. Um, and then, you know, the majority of that is, you know, it's ignorance if you don't do that. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of offensive. Um, so that's why in every opportunity we have and every celebration that I have about my culture, I try to educate a little bit about what it is and what it means, you know, through the food, obviously. Um, so yeah, like Mexico is the only country to worry about the UNESCO, you know, about the, you know, heritage cuisine, you know, like passed from thousands of years, you know, um, and we keep still using, you know, like pre-Hispanic, pre uh, ingredients, recipes and techniques, and is the only country awarded with this. So I think, um, people that, you know, represent Mexican cuisine, they have to be more responsible and, and, you know, learn a little bit more about their history and you know to represent the better too so i think i think uh, we start from ours you know like how are you going to represent culture if you do it responsibly if you are knowledgeable about your culture then you can truly about it the market is always going to be there there's always going to be a fusion it's always going to be there but if you know what your culture and your food come from you're going to be a lot more clear about what you want to you know show and educate other people from other cultures, you know, and is, uh, you know, here at the restaurant, we show our culture, you know, through the art, you know, Arturo Morales is our artist and he paints, you know, uh, truly pretty funny um, art. Then we want to show people like, look, for example, this used to be our rain, you know, before we were Christians, 
we have church views in in the restaurant that separates the Christianisms before, you know, like in pre-Hispanic times, we weren't Christians, you know, after the Spaniards conquered to the religion. And, you know, that's how we became, you know, like Christians. So it's things like that, you know, and obviously the evolution with ingredients and the food and the techniques, that's what it makes our culture so diverse. I mean, do you guys feel like, um, do you feel like people are more uh, looking more for an experience, I mean, Gilma, you uh, you you talked about it a little bit, you know, with regard, and, and Oscar, you just did as well, with regard to you know the atmosphere, the music, um, you know, being educated on what they're eating. Um, I I feel you know like that that clearly is you know a, a trend in a lot of the restaurant industry, you know, the travel industry. People are booking experiences a lot now. Um, do you see that as, as something that's evolving, that, that people are, are really wanting to be educated and, and be more thoughtful about what they're eating, where they're going, what they're experiencing? I believe so. I believe that um, because there's more traveling, people are more open to, to um, learning more and to experiencing more um, of other cultures. Um, at Art, we um, it's very important for us to have that education piece. When we opened our food truck, uh, it was very challenging, very challenging because um, what's known, you know, as, as me as different from Paola and Chef Oscar, it's Mexican food is very well known here in Grand Rapids, you know, in our area, everywhere. I think that that's very well known. But when we came out with the food truck, um, people will ask, what is Dominican? What is Dominican food? What do you mean? Where is the Dominican Republic? So we would have to have that teachable moment. And, and for me, it was very important because I wanted people to know you're not just eating food. You, you need to know what you're eating. You need to know where it's coming from. Uh, at our Caribbean fusion cuisine, like I said before, we, we wanted you to have the experience. Um, when we first opened last year, we had a popsicle uh, made out of batata and cocoa. So it's, it was sweet potato and coconut. And we would serve them in a little like popsicle bags um, and tie them. And we would make this about the restaurant. Um, and we would serve them as a dessert and people would just either ask for a cup or just look at them. And at, from the kitchen, I would be watching what the clients were doing with the popsicles. And I would tell the server, hey, you have to go tell them how to. And sometimes they were embarrassed to go and tell them. But I will come out of the kitchen and say, okay, I'm gonna show you and I'll come with one and, and tell them the story why I included them, what memory it had for me, but also how to te teach them how to eat them. Because it was something that, you know, here you have popsicles, but um, they're not the same in the little funditas, how we call them, a lot of the funditas, we call them back in the Dominican Republic. And, and that was very important. And the customers will love the whole explanation of where this ice cream was coming from, you know, because people want to learn, you know, it's not just eating. It's you want to learn, you want to have that experience. You want to know where things are coming from. Um, we have a sign at the restaurant that uh, it was very important to us. It's um, every family has a story. Welcome to ours. We have had clients that cry with us. Oh. When we tell them our story and why we have that there, we have clients that share their stories with us. And that that is amazing. You know, that's amazing when you I grew I, I was born in the state. I was born in New Jersey, but I grew up in the Dominican Republic. And and when you have coffee in a restaurant, we serve you in a bandeja. We serve you in a in a little bandeja with coffee mugs from the Dominican Republic. We bring you the, the coffee pot to you so you can serve your own coffee. And all of those are memories that I have from when I grew up in a patio in Dominican Republic. So those things are very valuable to our clients too. They want to know. So don't. I, I always tell people, don't be afraid of sharing your story. Don't be afraid of sharing your culture because people want to learn. And I, and I think the word you use is exactly perfect, uh, the value, the value of it, the, the vision of it, and, and, and that they're not going to find in any other chain restaurants. There's no value there. There's no experience. There's no story there. We have it in the small uh, restaurants, and, and I feel that it makes it separate. It's totally separate as well. 
other restaurants who would we provide that experience. I love it because I remember when I went, I had my coffee in the little tray and all of it. And yeah, I, I probably didn't experience that growing up, like you did, but now we're connected in that way. And it, it really brings us closer and sort of dividing us more, separating what the Latin America culture is of, okay, you're from more the South, I'm from Mexico and all those division. And, and I like when you hear your story, last time in the Spanish version about having to include tacos in the food truck menu because people assume, oh, it's a food truck, let's go get tacos. What's Dominican? They should have tacos and, and things like that. And what Chef Oscar's point of the market, there is a market for it and there is a demand for it and that's why people do it. Now you can go to the store and get decorations for both, Cinco de Mayo and Dia de los Muertos. It's commercial now, it's out there and it's okay. But uh, what Jorge, said before as long as we do it respectfully and we're notable about the holiday you go for it so for that when when that happened to me with the sombreros and all that it was a time for me to reflect and hey wait a minute maybe i'm doing it too and i haven't even realized it and that's when i stopped going to like irish on iona and things like that when it's gonna be pointless just drinking just of it instead of okay embracing the reason or the cultural aspect of it and that's why i love our festival so much because you can truly feel and experience that purpose that mission that celebration that's why it's so important and hopefully now this year is uh looking ahead the summer we have them um since we didn't have them last year um so uh I guess I, I want to ask all of you your opinion on, you know, when you're when you're doing your menu, like you said, you know, you had to include a taco. Um, how do you feel about? Do you, do, do you feel? Um, I mean, I don't know, resentful, or do you feel like when you have to include some things that are maybe not what you would want to put on the menu, but you feel like people expect it to be there? Um, you know, how does that make you feel? And then I guess all of that, you know, how <laughs> how did you feel about Taco Bell being voted the best taco? <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um, one is because if I'm gonna put a taco in my menu, um, I'm gonna use the regional like ways to do it. Like we do the Nista Mal, so the Nista Mal is cooking the corn in calcium and let it soak overnight to make the corn more nutritious and you're more um, digestible. And then you create the tortillas from there uh, because that will have a different flavor and consistency also. Then my tacos being pretty Spanish, they don't have dairy on it. And I often get people, hey, can you put cheese in here? And say, hey, no, this is, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a truly taco. And that's what I want to show you. Can you please taste it without the dairy? And just let me know if you don't like it. And, you know, and after that, you know, the education part is, you know, not expected in Mexican cuisine. Like, you know, they think a lot of times, you know, like Mexican traditional is Tex-Mex. You know, you expect it to see the cheese and the dairy on it. And to me, that covered the flavors of the truly Mexican food. So it's like, you know, can you please experience this without expecting the cheese and, you know, the dairy or the gluten and, and the food? And then if you don't like it, obviously you don't pay, but I'm trying to, you know, bring you like what is truly yeah. Mexican. Yeah. Yeah, what What about you? Go ahead. For us, um, like Paula said, we, when we opened the food truck, I think it was almost a year and um, people kept asking for tacos, tacos, tacos. And I said, well, tacos are not Dominican. <laughs> they had tacos to the food truck. You know, I, I wanted I, I wanted to keep it original. I wanted to keep my menu in, in with Dominican street food. Um, so one day we decided uh, we were going to Riverside Park, and I said, "Let's let's try it. Let's see what happened." So we added tacos al pastor, and because I, they're my favorite tacos, and we added them to the food truck, and within an hour we were out. We were out, and I said, "Well, then let's keep the tacos then, if that's what's going to sell." But when people come to our res, to our the food truck, and they ask. Okay, so what's good? I always start with a Cuban sandwich. And I always say that's what we're known for. You know, you can have the tacos if you want to, but this is right. what we're known for. The Cuban sandwich. It's all it's we make our own sauce. It's we make our own roasted pork. And I go beyond and explain what we're known for. 
Uh, but it was hard to add it. And for me, it was very challenging because I said, well, we're not known for that. Why would I add tacos? But, you know, I did it and it has worked out for our food truck menu. And um, but we also have our empanadas. We have our you know loaded fries. They're more more of an American item, if you would call it loaded fries. Mm -hmm. But we add our Caribbean roasted pork. We added pork. We added our house sauce. Um, so we, we try to adjust it just because of the, the food truck clientele that we have built. Um, at the restaurant, though, we if you go to the restaurant, you're going to have that rice and beans and our oxtail mm -hmm. uh, which is, is our number one seller for our restaurant, the oxtail stew. Um, our empanadas, we have an empanada has become very popular and it's a coconut curry empanada. Mm. And right away you go to Indian food with curry, right? So but it's an, an empanada. So we, we we do those triggering just to call people's attention to to make them maybe try it so that we can then go for it and explain other food items. <laughs> yeah, I think at the, it's a game. Uh, at the it's a mind game. <laughs> <laughs> We probably, my mom was so embarrassed. She's proud, she's not proud of having wet burritos, you know? And even before we took over in 2007, I mean, the previous owner had them already and it was kind of like her idea. She was working there already with uh, Chef Manuel. And as a server, she saw the, the menu, like, you know, you know, back then people thought, okay, Mexican food, bit line, uh, I don't know, Taco Boy, all those places, and they all had, you know, wet burritos. So p p customers at the restaurant kept asking, you have wet burritos. And so my mother convinced the previous owner, like, you, we need them in the menu, especially for lunch. You know, people want them. So they added them. And when once we took over, they stayed because it's kind of like expected. And people want, if they want to go safe or probably have a burrito or, you know, a fajita or something like that. But no, we, we try to include in our menu what I mentioned before, cactus and frijoladas, la coyo, sopes. And she's currently working on a new recipe. We're excited. And um, we we need to find that balance because for us it's not authentic, but if people want it and they feel safe, I mean, it, it, that's why it's there. and But we still try to make it at least good, right? We make our own salsas. We make the beans for the wet burritos. So, um, you know, you find your your balance there if that's what the customers are asking for. Yeah. Um, another thing that we try to do, and only one restaurant a long time ago was um, doing, was Tacos al Pastor but in the traditional trompo, we call it. So have you seen those, Jorge, right? The street tacos, like you get the meat, it's all wrapped meat in there and it's turning and it's cooking like a rotisserie chicken and you get your tacos out of it, but it's very, very concerning for the health department, so they not always allow it. And for a brief time, um, tacos, what was the name? Picositos? Remember Jorge on the vision? Which ones? Picositos. It, it, it was that the name? Yes, yes. Yeah, because we went for lunch there once. Right. Um, they had it. They had the, the, the tacos al pastor and the trompo, and, and it was great. Um, but yes, I think that when it comes to the demand, we as consumers sometimes want it too. Um, what, when you ask Jorge the question, what's American? It And Chef said perfectly, it's, we're all just a melting pot. We get to eat pizza, pasta. Uh, chicken nuggets and like sometimes in the same place they they do offer that kind of variety and and is is it american like you go to applebee's and now they do have like a taco salad or nachos or fajitas so they do cater to all kinds of cuisines and that's the reason why people you know we're saying oh no, we're inclusive and we're diverse and now I feel at that point, that's when we bring the authenticity. Why do we think it's authentic? Because we know what we're talking about because we're from those uh, regions. Um, so at the restaurant, we don't say, oh, it's authentic. We say it's traditional, that's what we're known for. Like Hilma was saying, Hilma, Chef Hilma was saying, the, the more you share, the more the customers will at least kind of like understand. But at other places, in big chains, they don't offer that experience. They will not have that knowledge. It's just 
another item on the menu. Right. Right. So yeah. I just, excuse me. Oh, go ahead. Go. I just, okay. Um, so talking about knowing about the culture, right? They're talking about tacos del pastor. The pastor is not even a truly Mexican dish. So it's not, it came from the uh, tacos Arabes, they call it. So the Arabians brought it to Puebla and then they used to be with lamb instead of pork. And in Mexico, we adapted, we added the pork and then we still use the same technique of the gyros. So that's how they roast it, you know. And obviously the health department don't allow it or they it's trying to, you know, like push us away from that because the, the meat still raw and then it will stay in the danger zone for a long time. So it's not gonna be, you know, like, healthy for uh, the, the consumers. So that's the reason we cannot do it that way. Um, but it's, you know, talking about West American cuisine, you know, also like I asked the same question, what is Mexican cuisine and where it came from? You know, that's that's my focus on. So. So I was just gonna add from a historical context, um, a lot of people don't know, but uh, for example, the, uh, the food that Paula was mentioning, wet burritos, that's not Mexican food. Um, in Mexico, we don't have ground beef in Mexico. Well, we do now, but I'm saying uh, it's not a tradition. Uh, we don't have yellow cheese. Uh, we don't have sour cream. We don't, I mean, everything that's in that wet burrito is everything but Mexican. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's considered uh, Tex-Mex, uh, which is an evolution of the Mexican food uh, and Texan food. Um, and, and that's the reason why you know, earlier when, when you asked Lori about the, um, how do we feel about, or how do our guests feel about the Taco Bell being voted, um, you know, best taco in West Michigan. Uh, and Chef Oscar said, you know, it's embarrassing. It is because we have so many, like, like even from different regions of Mexico, as far as traditional uh, tacos, and they're popping up everywhere, 28th Street um, Division, um, Granville Avenue, even downtown, and and yet for for uh, these places doing these voting things uh, and Taco Bell wins, it's like, it's like it's embarrassing, you know, for for us that really focus on traditional food. Right. Um, so I go I ahead. Think, yeah, I think if you're gonna do a contest, you have to educate yourself about it first. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to put panelists or people that's gonna vote. You know, like for the if you want to go traditional, I mean, you can, you can vote Taco Bell, the best taco is, you know, full of ignorance, you know, you don't know what Mexican cuisine is, you know, and then you just go by the flavor and the cost, you know, it's, oh, it's a cheap taco and it's, you know, I, it filled me up. So um, I think if you're going to do a contest, they have to like be more educated about like the culture they try to represent or compete, you know, for it. Right. Um, you know, I, I, grew up in New York, not in New York City, but close to New York City. And so, you know, we, it, bigger cities and clearly New York City, which is such a, you know, a melting pot, literally. Um, I had so much exposure to all different types of ethnic food. And it's, you know, I mean, that's, that is how New York City grew. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for a smaller community in the Midwest, like Grand Rapids, you know, the idea of introducing, um, you know, ethnic food, ethnic restaurants, you know, it, we're, we're, you know, we're behind the eight ball, um, but we're making progress. And so um, are you guys, what, what do you think about that? I mean, do you, do you see and do you feel as though people are, I mean, there's always going to be people that are not going to want to experiment, that are going to be perfectly happy going to Applebee's and saying they had a wet burrito and that was Mexican food. And that's, I mean, some people are never going to change. Right. But I, I think that as more and more um, traditional restaurants open up with the experience, with, you know, educating um, consumers on what they're eating, giving them that experience, I, I do feel like it's going to, you know, open up people's eyes and people are, are, you know, a lot of people crave that, but just have never had that opportunity here to experience that. And so I think, do you think that it's, it's being embraced more? 100%, I think. Uh, I think it's been embraced a lot more uh people are 
traveling more, you know, trying to learn about different cultures. Yeah, we're a little behind because um, we have to, every time it's like create our uh, atmospheres almost like to speak for itself. Like, look at this painting, it's from, you know, Mesoamerica. And I, some people don't understand what is pre-Hispanic food or, uh, you know, what's the difference between pre-Hispanic and modern cuisine. So, you know, it's just uh, every, every dish, like, you know, Hilma said, sometimes I have to come out of the kitchen and come in and educate you know, this is how you enjoy it better. This is how you eat it. This is how it's my tradition. If you, you know, experience it this way, next time you feel more inclusive and in how, you know, my culture truly is. And, you know, I have to do that a lot. And I think it's being persistent about it and, you know, obviously respectful. Um, but people, if they want to leave their experience, you know, there, it is a market for it. And, and I think that's why it's so important, at least to me, to educate my children on it too. And, and different cultures too, not only our own, but that they see not the difference, but the diversity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's important to, to have all those festivals and um, bring them so they try it. And, you know, you hate when people say, oh, I don't like it. You never try it. Well, I'm not going to like it. It's like, eat it. <laughs> and and uh, again, it comes with the language. Um, point and, and the food and uh, the different customs that different cultures have. I think that's my main focus and I think even partnering with the school district helps because they, they do make an effort to bring kind of like uh, that awareness to each of the different celebrations that we have for yeah. different cultures. Yeah, true. Yeah. I agree. Um, we, I probably am one of the person, the newest here in Michigan from all of you. you guys, it seems like you all been here for a long, many, many years. I've been in Michigan for 12 years and um, I look back from when I moved here and, and I used to remember, I used to sit down and say, what am I going to do? There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to do. And I used I, we go, my husband, and I go to Miami or New Jersey at least once a year and we just go, we have a list of food places that we want to go because we don't have it here. But now I, it's growing. And like all I was mentioning, the schools, there's more schools that have, in, in our case, Spanish immersion programs. And those schools are embracing different cultures. We recently had a school come into the restaurant. Um, and for me, that was super, super special. It was um, through preschool through second graders. And they came into the restaurant uh, with a full Dominican menu, rice and beans and, and chicken. And they were all wearing their banda Dominican bandanas, their Dominican colors. And they were all little American kids, none Hispanic. And they were all speaking Spanish. Oh they asked to dance bachata, merengue. And I was like, oh my goodness, not even my daughter does this. And I felt so special because I, wow, these, this school is showing these, the next generation a different you know they're showing different cultures and that's very important i think that if schools also do that more with with students future years are also are going to be much much better and growing more in the community more awareness yeah when our children are older they're not going to have taco bell as number one taco no. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's hope that doesn't happen ever again right um, well, we are just um, out of time, and I would love to just go around one more time and have each one of you, I always like to do this, like, I don't know, some sort of parting words, you know, what do you want people to remember um, from this discussion this morning? Um, Paula, I'll start with you. Ooh, it's been a lot, but again, um, as restaurant owners, we try to embrace so many different things at the same time, our cultural traditions, our authenticity. Let's reflect on the times that, as I mentioned before, we might have done it in a disrespectful way to another culture. And and it's okay. It's it's good to learn from our mistakes and, and mistakes and maybe try not to do it again. And, and I, I guess it's okay our younger generations to to do the same, to keep learning and embracing the different cultures, languages and cuisines that we have here in West Michigan. Great. Thank you. Yuma. Um, well we we thank all the support from our community. 
And we also want to ask that um, continue to support us, continue to support small businesses because we put a lot, a lot of efforts into providing you with authentic culture, experience, and all the love in our food. We we would like to, you know, like Paula said, continue to embrace our culture, continue to share it with our with our community, and that when you come in to our places, that you feel that home style, that you feel that love and passion for our culture, our food, our music. And then when you come in, you have a fun time and a memorable experience. So we invite you to come visit us and try some Dominican delicious food uh, that we, you won't find in another place just at our Caribbean Fish and Cuisine. <laughs> Good commercial. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chef Oscar. All right. If we're going to do commercials, here we go. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Lots of commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I invite people to come in and, you know, uh, visit Mexico and live the experience of pre-Hispanic and uh, traditional Mexican cuisine. Uh, we make everything in house. We even have greenhouses to grow our herbs. Um, oh. We make our everything, our own bread for our sandwiches, every, everything. So we made that with love to share our culture and our history and, you know, um, we have people to like keep supporting us. Great. Well, I really appreciate everybody taking the time this morning to, to be here and have this discussion and we will hopefully see you all guys, see all you guys soon. So Jorge, thanks a bunch. Thank you, Jorge. Can, can I have my party awards too? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Jorge? No, I mean, for, for all of our viewers now and, and then later, because we are doing a Facebook Live, um, as I'm looking at Hilma, Paula, and Chef Oscar, made me realize that um, the reason why we did this show um, and the reason why people are like, oh, why is Hilma having an issue with tacos? Uh, we isn't that all Latin America. And it's not the case. Latin America is made up of 27 countries that have different customs, different foods, different traditions, different music. And the only one thing that holds us together is the fact that we were invaded by Spain and we happen to speak Spanish. That's the only thing that unites us. Other than that, we're all very different. The food in the Caribbean, because of the nature of being tropical, very different than the food in Mexico. And that's where I just wanna say that because some people might be like, well, isn't it all Mexican food? Like, no, 27 different countries. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to exclude you from the parting comments and that was very important, so. <laughs> it's my commercial. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Oh, oh, oh look, here's a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> There's a commercial. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.